was happy because I won the race. I was only very, very tired. I was really tired. Uh, I had been so hard, hot. I didn't have any drink during the race, technical problem. So I was completely down physically after all but because I won the race, then it makes everything so much easier to recover, to come back again. So in the evening I was alright, in the evening I was okay already. So quietly, calmly, he made his way back and drove the track once again. He needed it to save her life to savor his victory. People say he often gives the impression of being asleep before the start. But how can they know the tension of the Formula One Grand Prix? so much to learn and to do, I believe, that for me, the only way to be stronger, to be more self-confident, that I'm doing really the maximum that I can be under those circumstances, is by concentrating and trying to remember every single detail regarding that situation to imagine any future problems and therefore get it as right as possible. And you develop through the year, through the time you develop. Ayrton used to protect his palms, otherwise he developed blisters that would prevent him from driving well. Today he no longer does this as his new car is easier to handle. He checks whether he has cleaned the shield of his helmet. One may think this is stupid, but compensation, as well as a flapping shield, can make a driver lose a race. No wonder he needs to drink water all the time, since he sweats enormously during the race, sometimes more than six pounds in 90 minutes. He quenches his thirst through a pipe that enters into the helmet. The pipe has to be fixed properly so as not to come off when he turns his head. It happened to him once, and he nearly lost the race because of it. In his head, he makes an endless detailed inspection. He checks the last minute tuning, and for the thousandth time he reviews it with Gérard de Gaulle, the Lotus Golf chief engineer. And then, before each Grand Prix, he has the condition of the track and its abrasiveness checked. It's of paramount importance for his race strategy in anticipation of tire abrasion. He's probably the only one that does this. It's never over. The smallest adjustment error of an angle of the will the catastrophe. During the race, it will be too late to think about it and adjust it. You don't have the people to look and say, this, 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 this is all your brain. Then think about the car specifically to see if all the buttons are well placed, if they are all in the right position. Then after the engine start, you must do this, this, this. During the warming up lap, you must change other things. You have to, you have to hit the brakes during the warm up lap. You have the brakes hot when you start the race. Um, think about any later modifications you can make in the car, small ones, just to make it a bit better. Which tires other people are going to use in compare with yours, then what should happen, what should be the development of the race. It's like infinite, you know, so many things that if you really go deep inside, you never finish. So that's not the point. You must know where is the limit, not trying to overdo it. Then you go mad. You break down. So you have to go do as much as you can, but then realize, be able to realize where is the point where you must stop and let it go from there. Uh, 
of other people think those are the things we do. that there's not enough time or space in the brain to let all the information in to integrate and react. So it rapidly becomes exhausting. Many tracks you you are under the maximum fuel. So you use a lot of power because the fuel is not a problem on the circuits. And it's too much. Like in the street circuit, normally there is no problem with fuel. And the speed, the acceleration that you have it's unbelievable, it's too much. And during a one and a half hour or two hours, you get stress, you lose concentration because you get tired, and dehydrate, and start to be dangerous because you are more open to make mistakes. And what I've been doing, go back, the goal of the objective is what we always want. You change the places, and people, but the main motivation is to always be the first to win, to be the fastest. Um, it's the best motivation, the only one, the real motivation. To be the best, to keep you strong, to be um, happy, because it's a big challenge. When he feels it is one of those blessed days when nothing will prevent him from crossing the finish line first, he reassures in the pits by the radio. He says everything's all right. We're going to make it easy. No problem. He feels they always appreciate him. So whatever he wins, when he crosses this wretched line first, it's a great feeling. He sees with a tremendous feeling of well-being. He doesn't understand how it's possible to run the game to win. The only motive for racing is to carry out the victory. His life is devoted to racing. Enjoy more the time that you have at home. When he wins, he's more relaxed. Sometimes the thought of vacation flashes through his mind as he takes the lead. Put it this way, it's very important that I'm always fit and healthy. So some sport that could be very dangerous for me to hurt my arm or my leg or even something else, I think twice. Because if I hurt, and it takes me one mouse to recover. Maybe I don't have one mouse to recover because I'm racing next weekend.
Perhaps it's a professional idiosyncrasy, but he can't do anything without considering the technical aspect of everything. For him, sheer speed and even victory do not mean much without making use of the sharpest, most sophisticated technology. That is why he's interested in knowing that water skis are made of carbon. What also keenly interests him, in speed, is the skill, precision, reflexes, and alertness it requires, wherever it may be, on the sea, in the air, or on the circuits. People say that apart from speed and Formula One, or more precisely victory, there's nothing else in life. That's true. It's true that today, he has only one aim, to win. But what about love? I hope so. Probably is not the time now, it's not the right time, but uh, I believe that the right time will come. It's just the question is when. Does being a celebrity bother him? No, it's good when you come to a restaurant, there's a big queue, and somebody recognizes you and they put you in front of the queue. That is very good. When, uh, when you go to other places and, they, and you want to be on your own and nobody to come and talk to you as well as somebody you want to be relaxed, then people start coming, then it's not so good. But celebrity isn't really important. It's something that doesn't really matter in one's life. But what, what it really matters to me is, is the feeling of driving and the feeling of competition. And the special feeling of it. That's what keeps me going. Have you found out why he's so good? Je crois qu'il a les pieds sur terre avant et avant tout. Il pense vraiment à ce qu'il fait, il se concentre à 100% pour la course. Et puis il est très très doué. Et le don, c'est quoi en deux mots Le don, c'est de pouvoir aller vite sur terre dans n'importe quelle condition, sans avoir de problème, sans sortir de la route, sans faire de faute. Et au départ, il a peut-être fait quelques petites erreurs, mais qu'il a commencé, quelques petites sorties de route, cinq minutes c'est terminé, il a appris à garder sa voiture sur la route, et tant qu'il a gardé sur la route, il est devant. Alors d'après vous, les gens qui l'appellent le magicien, n'exagèrent pas un petit peu quand même je crois qu'on est tous des magiciens finalement, parce qu'il y a des choses qui sont très difficiles à faire et que tout le monde arrive à faire, mais il est particulièrement doué. Il y a quand même une chose qu'il faut dire, c'est qu'on peut contre Sénat, mais c'est non-sèche, de toute façon, que je l'aime beaucoup et que je trouve que c'est un super pilote, donc un des meilleurs de cette génération. Mais si on veut, si on veut encore une fois être objectif, il y a quand même une voiture où il est tout seul dans son équipe, et donc... Pour moi, personnellement, je ne pourrais, je pourrais jamais considérer que Sénat est le meilleur entre nous et je serais capable de l'admettre un jour tant qu'il n'acceptera pas d'être dans une équipe avec un, un pilote du même calibre que lui et avec la même voiture que lui. Once more, I think he's a complete driver. He's a tremendous natural talent. He's intelligent. He has youth. He has the possibility for the regulations. He's not a motor chassis. He's not a motor chassis. The problem is that he's not a motor chassis. The problem is that he's not a motor chassis. The problem is that he's not a motor chassis. The problem is that he's not a motor chassis. It's always good to have people looking in a positive way to you or transmitting positive things to you than if you have a feeling that people are against you, of course. That keeps you happier, that keeps you more natural, 
and probably helps you doing what you're supposed to do. When I started with them, I didn't have the car, the tires were not flat, square. They were a bit round, so I was going like this, you know. Once again, for him, racing is not meant for the pleasure of driving, but above all, for winning. But to win, one has to apply three strict rules. First, work. Second, work. Third, work. People just aren't aware of the amount of work the tuning of a high-performance Formula One requires. They think the practice session serves simply as comparative tests to establish the starting grid, but the sessions are only the visible part of a huge iceberg. A Formula One has to be tuned like a musical instrument, like the rigging of a sailboat. One has to consider plenty of elements that interact simultaneously, such as more or less wind for more or less downforce, selecting the tires with more or less resilience according to the condition of the track, adjusting the suspension and the length of the gearbox ratio, and so on. It's never over. Whenever tuning seems right, it has to be tested on the circuit. And to test it, the single-seater has to be driven all out. It's rapidly exhausting for the driver. When the car seems satisfactory, one has to compare its performance with that of its rivals. More often than not, the comparison changes everything. And you have to start from scratch again. At low rev, 9 to 10, or 10. Yeah, 9 to 10 especially, I don't get the boost. Yeah. What you said, you have to start the boost, you don't boost. I would... Currently, competition doesn't only take place on the track between the drivers. It's a battle between the world's largest car manufacturers. And this battle rages to the utmost limits of the most advanced technologies. Faced with computers raining like masters in the pits, the drivers have yet to be able to analyze their sensations while learning how to speak the data processing language. This profusion of high technology has only one goal, to race faster than the others. For this, there is a first judgment, that of the timed practice sessions, which designate the pole position, the first place of the event. It's something crazy, a sort of medieval tournament between contestants that can't see each other, that pretend not to know each other, that spy on each other through figures that flip by the screen. It's another exercise apart from racing. This close contest is exhilarating. When the time comes to go, then he gives us all. He is ready to maintain top speed on the razor's edge. That is the price to pay for the pole position. And the pole position is the first run of the ladder to absolute victory. When he's on pole position, he already has the first sensation of victory.
with this lead position as reward, there comes the real star. And once again, everything passes through his mind during this period of waiting. This seems to last forever before letting her go. Sometimes he's content to really drive intuitively, instinctively. On the contrary, at other times, he has to drive more with his head than with his senses. As a rule, he has to try to keep the best compromise possible between natural instinct and the technique he's learning. When you work, when you devote all your time to reaching a sole objective that only success can reward, if you fail for whatever reason, then it's a terrible, unpleasant feeling of frustration. That's the most difficult aspect of this job. The only reason to drive a Formula One in a race is to win. Sometimes there's a tense atmosphere, but I've never experienced a moment when we could say the atmosphere was really bad. I think that as in any racing team, there are serious discussions between drivers and technicians about the weak spots of the car. I think it's normal, it's necessary, it's almost uh, wanted. That situation is very difficult to keep up. The main thing is to believe you have the possibility to be competitive. So, even if it's hard, if you know you have a good team, a good team and everything that you can fight, it's going to be hard, whatever, but you have the possibility that you will feel strong. But if you, before you start a race meeting, you know that that race, for any reason, you have no chance to win, then it's very difficult. Feel strong, to feel well, to give your best. And that is the hardest side of my profession, really, because the only reason to drive is to compete and to win. And if before you do it, you don't have no chance to win, a very difficult one, very small one, there's the motivation. Looking to the next one, waiting for the next, the next fight. Yes, the only reason for racing is winning, since victory sweeps everything else away and justifies everything. But winning a race is not enough. Sometimes it's even useless. What matters is to be world champion. It is the only real victory in Formula One, and it is this victory, the greatest victory of his life, that he is still racing for. For years, he's been reaching for the moon, but for the present, he's only seen its hidden face.